Okay, let's go again. Um, over the board season, I think it's starting soon. By the way, I think I've got a match on Monday coming up. Then a match the, ne the next Monday. Then the next Monday. I think four Mondays in a row actually. So it's all starting. It's all kicking off. Uh, for Varnick Chaska, Muswell Hill. Um, there's a few away matches. I'm going to try and play in one or two of those. Um, so between the two clubs, I'm going to get a bit of over the board activity soon. So anyway, who's on here? Um, <clears throat> ah, Kowalski. Okay. Uh, it's not. It's not the famous Felix, Felix Kowalski of King's Head Chess Club, is it? Okay. So what about Tarash again with that C4? Surely I can have better luck than earlier. Try and get back to 2200. Oh dear, I don't like this line particularly. But it's okay. I think I think it's okay. I can play it the boring way with Queen D4. I can play it more exciting with Knight D4. I can play Knight D4. Try and keep the Queens on. But then aim for what? I don't really know. I think Adams had a quick win or two with uh, with a Knight F5 or something. H3, Queen F3, with pressure in the centre. I'll try that. H3, maybe that's not appropriate here because he's not actually attacking H2. But Queen F3, anyway, for Knight F5. Hmm. Is Queen F3? I can play Bishop F4 as well. If E5, Knight F5. He's opened up the C file. Wow. Can I not just play Queen F4 then? Uh, not minding the change of queens, and he wins a pawn. Okay, I want to play. Uh, what do I want to do here? Maybe just d5. Uh, maybe not. Uh, maybe just queen c3. Queen c3. Oh, I was asking for knight d5 or something. Okay, maybe back to d1. Nope. Well, he's got a good point there. Then, um, where is it comfortable, the queen here? Maybe c3. I like d5. I would just take. Hope for the best. Queen c3. Ah, oh, better move. I might make a move here. Queen e2. Just sack d4. That looks tempting, actually. Bishop e3. Let's see one with initiative. I think I'll do this. Uh, so he's going to take. I don't want this horrible. I don't want to lose the bishop pair. I can win a7 anyway. So I just want to maybe play bishop e6 at some point if he's not careful. Or bishop f4. Call this bishop back to g3 maybe. So bishop h1, bishop g3. All right, I'll protect this and play rook c1. Uh, a bit down on the clock. Okay, so rook c. Okay, get the bishop back to g3 here. Doesn't seem too bad with the queen on e2. That decision doesn't seem too bad. Just want to keep abreast on the clock though. I don't want to double the pawns, that's for sure. g4. Protect my g2. And this queen e5 might be useful. Uh, he doesn't really want to take. Over there, so I'll just play this for bishop c7 as a threat now. Okay, so queen e5 pins the knight, uh, the bishop, out to the queen. So rook c1, rook c1. I want to get maybe queen d6, evade queen d6, uh, knight e4, queen d7 with threats on the sub on the eighth. Uh, so it takes takes dangerous for the king. Oh, he's on my nice bishop. So bishop d5 here. Time to check out. Or bishop h4. Bishop h2. I think maybe. Or bishop f4. Maybe bishop f4. Let him play. Um, stops queen d2 actually. Well, has he just spawned my queen with f6? Oh no. Oh dear, oh dear. 
That's Queen H5. Hang on, no panic yet. Only square. <laughs> two minute twenty two. I'm messing around, almost losing my queen. Oh dear, how things have changed in this position. Uh, what about Queen F7? Another invasion point. Forget C7. That seems to be cut off. Still playing that bishop. Uh, queen F7. Bishop is certainly just takes, there's nothing, isn't there? Okay, if I just play bishop e3 for a sec then. Let him have that um, pawn, because I think this is too dangerous over here. My queen can also switch him potentially. In fact, d5 would be on. I could have just taken on d5. Whoops. Mind you, then b2. Oh, okay, I've got the a file. Kind of attack. Like d5 coming up, queen a5. If he takes here, queen a5. Um, prospects, attacking prospects with d5. Hmm. <clears throat> takes on c1, takes queen b3, queen a5, queen b2. Then I'm in trouble. d5, I want a7. b6, I can't take as a queen c1. Okay. What does that say about the position? Queen f7, queen a5 as possibilities. d5 is also another possibility. Uh, but I'm forced to recapture here. Brain the size of a planet, and I'm forced to open the door. Marvin, Hitchhiker's Guide. Well, I've got to recapture the rook. Uh, Anyone could have recaptured the rook there. But now, is there a point to be creative soon with queen a5 or queen f7? Or um, queen f7, d5? Don't know. Um, queen b3, queen a5, queen b2, d5, he's got b6. Okay. Okay, let's go back onto this. He's got queen d5 coming up. Uh, but anyway, it looks attacking to play queen a5. Okay, so he blockades with queen a5. I've gained time on the clock. Queen d5, queen c7, back row, cheapo. Right, so d5 here, just extend the scope of the bishop for queen b6. Okay, I can just put the bishop on here now. A oh, nice blockade. Okay, losing a pawn, but uh, I've got the c file. I can kick the knight with f3 back, and I can play queen c3 threatening a big cheapo with uh, queen c8. Uh, so queen c8, big cheapo threat. Uh, he hasn't got knight, he's got knight h3, okay. I think he's missed the cheapo threat. Queen c8, oh no, actually he's got queen b8 at the end of that. So I think this diagonal needs to be used. Uh, what about mm, bishop? Keep the bishop over there. He's got, okay, he's getting control of the game. Whoops. The pawn would be a bit loose on d3 though, wouldn't it? I hope. Uh, probably not ideal. Blockade it there. Oh, he's got knight f4. No, he's knight f4, bishop g. Oh, there. What about bishop c5? Bishop e3. Uh, so knight e2, king f2. Oh, dear. Getting slaughtered. There's queen g3. Okay, um, I'm going to have to play for rook d3 of queen g3. Or, um, or queen c5 here, just to simplify. Okay, not ideal. This wasn't surely a logical consequence of the position from before. Oh dear. About to lose a whole bishop now for nothing. Oh man. I can't take his E2 being so crushing. Oh. oh, I'm going to take this and try and win his queen side pawns. For his queenside pawns over here. 
Is it messing around? I'm not going for my pawns yet. Big mess. I've made the position. <clears throat> Afternoon all. I had what I thought was quite a disappointing game uh, yesterday, which I haven't yet uploaded, but it will be an addendum to the video which I'm going to upload. I, this is the post mortem for the game. It was against Kowalski, who I've beaten twice before actually, and I was a bit higher rated, not by much. He's 2126. Pardon me, I was 2193. And we started with e4, and he played the French defence. And after d4, d5, actually, my least favourite is when um, the position doesn't remain uh, closed, but black tries a kind of Tarash defence type of strategy of not minding an isolated queen's pawn. Uh, so against the Tarash variation is kind of play like the Tarash defense. It's, it's the kind of open variation here with c5. And black is often in exchange for the isolated queen's pawn getting very nice bishops. And my results generally have been pretty uh, not, not as good as in the closed uh, positions. Um, I think that might be a style thing. But there was an interesting discovery I made through technical analysis in this game, which I thought might be interesting to share with you, relating uh, to the isolated queen's pawn. Um, now, our generally, our thoughts about the isolated queen's pawn, well, that they are very controversial. They increase the scope of black's pieces, like the bishops. But, uh, you know, later it could be blockaded, it could become a target. And sometimes we've seen examples in the past uh, where actually to exploit it, like what often players have played knight e6, move like knight e6, getting a pawn back here and then targeting that pawn and not the isolated pawn. So sometimes there's subtle ways of actually exploiting it. And here I was actually a bit shocked um, that um, the way uh, to exploit it was to try and get uh, bad pieces from it from the opponent. And I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but actually to try and defend the isolated queen's pawn uh, when it's attacked, the opponent's pieces uh, may be in suboptimal uh, positions where tactically they can be exploited. And this is one aspect I haven't really, I don't usually consider as part of my generalization uh, for thinking about the isolated queen's pawn. Uh, and it was just a bit of engine analysis, which actually required almost that kind of uh, very dynamic thinking in order to realize a, a key kind of thematic move which intuitively I thought was just liberating my bishop but actually there, there was an implication of what I've just said that to attack the isolated queen's pawn sometimes the opponent's pieces will go into suboptimal positions which you can then tactically exploit um, okay so let's have a look at what I'm talking about so I did play e takes d, and then there was queen takes d5 actually. And there isn't an isolated queen's pawn at the moment. Pardon, pardon me, and, and the player with it actually, sorry, the player with it will be um, white for, for the moment. I, I will have the isolated queen's pawn for, for a long while. Uh, but later, actually, I, I turn my isolated queen's pawn into the opponent's one. And that's where this strategy comes into play. I, I know it's a bit long-winded, but I've had such bad results in this line that I like to research the ideas behind it, how I actually can get an advantage. I think it's difficult sometimes, but it's, you know, Michael Adams is one player who has great results, I think, in this line. He can soak up the black counterplay. Um, and just win it seems quite effortlessly, effortlessly sometimes. So anyway, I played knight g f3, and he took. Uh, so I've got to regain that pawn. Uh, so this is all theory to regain the pawn. And the boring move is after takes uh, to take with the queen. But I wanted the queens on. And I remember some Adams games with h3 and queen f3. And that's what I headed for actually. After he attacked the bishop, um, 
I keep the bishop on this diagonal actually so I play bishop b3 and he plays something which seems to be quite logical he's not putting his king on the king's side he wants to just put pressure on the d file so actually he prepares the castle queen side uh, and his bishops are kind of good I think John Spillman's won a few games with black in this line it's been it's been a good score for John Spillman as black so h3 and now black castles queen side and I haven't actually got much to write home about at the moment but I play the queen f3 move now which might have been inappropriate actually because it is giving uh, the option to give me an isolated queen's pawn um, but I thought you know would he really take on d4 to open up the c file uh, this is where you know dynamics come into play here so I'm swapping my isolated queen's pawn for potentially you know the bishop pair the dark square pressure which might result um, but also uh, the, the, the semi-open c file of course uh, so I thought it was overall it was worth it but he's in a position now to set up a seemingly nice blockade on d5 so he does take actually and play bishop c6 with tempo so the c file it's difficult to ex try and exploit it now and in fact I had a difficult decision already you know about defending this pawn or not and I decided not to which is actually I think a good move actually to play queen e2 just to let it be taken here because of bishop e3 uh, with, with some pressure and here's an, a variation I stored from earlier so if takes bishop e3 he could pin rook fd1 and I'm getting uh, compensation here for the pawn say knight d5 takes so he's got an isolated pawn here rook ac1 the quality of the pieces it's in sort of white's favor a little bit because this bishop's more passive than this bishop um, if we carry this on I think I'd be okay here so bishop f4 black black's actually on the defensive uh, of course it's not all four smooths but I think white's okay here even though white is um, a pawn down it's difficult for black I believe if we just get an engine evaluation of this position uh, okay so it's slightly better for some reason for white um, so I can get that board uh, without it disappearing nope I can only get two lines it seems nowadays okay I'll try and get two lines back in the recording area so you see that white even though white is a pawn down here uh, there seems to be some sort of compensation going on which is difficult to explain okay perhaps uh, concretely but black looks a bit passive anyway and his king is sort of stuck there with that bishop cutting across the diagonal so I think that's obviously a big part of it and well intuitively I would, I would say that's a big part of it uh, and this bishop scope um, idea comes into play anyway in this game. So queen e2, he plays actually king b8. And I play bishop g5 with the idea of rerouting uh, the bishop. Okay, so he gets out of that diagonal, rook fd1, protecting the pawn. I come to this diagonal anyway, and I thought the worst is over. I've got nice control of e5. You know, okay, he's got a blockade square, but I've got two bishops. So can white actually be uh, worse here? Well, he reinforces his blockade on d5 now by playing uh, the move. Um, actually, let's, let's put this to the right a bit. Pardon me. He plays the move bishop d5. I put the, the rook on the c file now so that there's an immediate threat of bishop c7. And I don't mind the fracturing of, of the pawn here because I want the a file to work with. Rook c8 challenges, uh, protects against bishop c7. I play actually another you know, lunging move, queen e8, which almost I thought gets me in trouble now. Because what he does, he cuts off my queen from retreating backwards. Although I've pinned this bishop to a5, this next move has just cut off my queen from, from, from going back. And I suddenly thought after bishop f4 that f6 was going to win my queen. Of course, the knight had just been on f6, protecting h5. But thankfully, now that the knight's not there, there is one square, and one square only, because the knight's also stopping the queen going here. But thankfully, there's h5. So a sigh of relief. Well, in the commentary, which is, you, you'll see the exact um, emotions anyway, you'll hear the exact emotions. Queen b6. Okay, and he's putting more pressure on b3, but is he really going to take it? In fact, after bishop e3 does take it, he takes on c1. 
but he doesn't take on b3 now actually he plays queen d6 and I, I actually um I think I've already missed something earlier actually um, that there was something very nice here that the weakness of the last move he's just cut, come off d5 so I could have actually just taken there and then taken so that was a major like blunder actually in this game so I let him get away with queen b6 which seems to have you know put pressure on b2 and d4 but he, you know he needed to to maintain defense of d5 but uh, let's forget that um, the really interesting thing from my point of view is the dynamics of the isolated queen's pawn here after queen uh, d6 I've got the a file and I've got the bishop on e3 which at the moment is as dead as um, well it's, it's not particularly active I want to activate that bishop and I want to use the a file so this next move looks logical as well queen a5 and he sort of weakens these dark squares which cries out for me to liberate the bishop and here is the fascinating thing liberating the bishop with a pawn sack is a little bit controversial and I remember some game of actually Magnus Carlsen doing this like d5 mysteriously and then winning but that was Magnus Carlsen very very mysterious some of these games with pawn sacks but here we see d5 e takes d and my reaction here was actually just to hold this position actually to hold this position to keep the blockade to keep the threats up on the dark squares and I played what I thought was a, a reasonable idea just to hold the position now even after sacking a pawn just to play the quiet move bishop d4 but actually um, he gets a very good maneuver in uh, from this position and it all goes a bit pear shaped actually because uh, he plays rook e8 I kick the knight thinking I'm going to get a better bishop versus knight but the knight now comes to e6 you see and it covers this diagonal and it goes from bad to worse actually I move the bishop and then d4 and he's ramming this pawn down my throat and he, he, he rests the advantage basically but what I found fascinating from the engine analysis of this position that instead of the move bishop d4 conceptually we have this opportunity here uh, to put more pressure on the isolated queen's pawn with the move rook d1 I don't know how many of you would think of the move rook d1 and think how harmless it is just to put more pressure on the isolated queen's pawn and this is really one of the main points I wanted to make with this video that our engines, you know, contributing to our understanding actually of isolated queen's pawns. Nimzovich considered the isolated queen's pawn to be one of the most complex things to try and understand. So here uh, we've gone from a position where white had the isolated queen's pawn. Now black's temporarily got an isolated queen's pawn, but white is a pawn down. On the other hand, the bishop has been liberated, which coordinates potentially with the queen. So we've got some a-file pressure. If only these a6 can be undermined. Now, ancient analysis reveals actually why it has an advantage. But how many of us would consider rook d1 and why? It turns out that the move rook d1, um, basically, uh, what does black do to defend d5? Black's forced virtually to defend it with the move rook d8. And this is the point actually that actually. Uh, now with rook d8 the queen is actually automatically made more effective by eyeing d8 because tactically we've created the responsibility now on the black queen to defend d8 and I thought that's kind of fascinating that that's why this position has given advantage to white by using the isolated queen's pawn to actually drag opponents pieces to defensive positions where they're actually tactically more more uh, open um, to tactical lawsuits, to, to losing material, to, to tactical threats. The you know bishop f4 and queen d8 is a tactical threat. But white in this position, if we look at the engine evaluation, even though white's pawn down, it's slightly better for white because of b4 now. Uh, so not only maintaining the threat of bishop f4, but also trying to plow in um, to the a4. And if the king moves, then bishop f4 is skewing the queen and king anyway. Uh, you know, King B8 would be a disaster here. Bishop F4 just winning D8. So actually, this simple move 
uh, delicate move. This is my point. That actually, do we have this higher level understanding of isolated queen's pawns that sometimes you can simply drag opponent's pieces to bad squares instead of the natural blockade? You know, you have a restrained blockade destroy is is a generalization. But in this particular position. The idea of making use of the isolated queen's pawn is to get one of the opponent's pieces in a tactically bad uh, state and automatically increase the effectiveness of one of your own. So actually rook d1 seems to be the right move. So the rooks put there and now b4 and it's difficult for black. He's sort of overloaded with the queen being more effective there. All of a sudden black's a bit overloaded. Can't move the pawn. Rook takes d4. The bishop's keeping a lot on key anyway. So a literal blockade of the isolated queen's pawn is not actually needed. So say black tries to escape the a-file attack. Now b5, and there's still a, a lot of pressure bearing down on black. Uh, so here, uh, say g5, well then you see uh, bishop b6 or bishop, so, so say bishop b6. Then takes it's 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 getting to be a big advantage. Um, and, and if Black's forced to like uh, I don't know play knight c5 check. Okay, we're following this through b4. And now there might be okay. Rook takes d5. The pawn's um, getting lost. The bishop's controlling c1. So no no lethal check. Rook d1 and white's clearly better. It's just fascinating. I think that the generalizations. Well, in the in the little details of the position, what dynamically is going on? If you could generalize it about how to exploit isolated queens more, I wouldn't have ever imagined that a simple like threat can sometimes actually be the absolute right move instead of the natural blockade of the isolated queens pawn to actually just play rook d1, get one of the opponent's pieces in a tactically uncomfortable position where you've actually increased the effectiveness of your own piece, and then you can carry on with your attack. Um, so I suppose that's kind of, I don't know, strengthening the position before going on the attack, and none of them is a bit strange, because because actually the queen being more effective is is a kind of strengthening, because you're making black more liable and and less able to move. Actually, the queen's not able to move because it's trying to protect d8 now. I just found that quite fascinating. I just wanted to share that with you. So the way I played it, even though I gave an initial boost of dynamism, I have lost the pawn. And black with that pawn just went on uh, to win the game, kind of ruthlessly pushing the pawn, and it was soon um, a loss for me. When my king also, um, you know, the worst happened. My my bishop actually got trapped rather embarrassingly. So this pawn actually then cost me the game. But it doesn't disprove that earlier d5 was actually the right move, but for the, this very very subtle reason. So anyway, I hope that might contribute something today to your understanding of isolated queen's pawns, as it did for me yesterday, just doing a, a post-mortem of that game. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.